Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Belinda Mollard. I am a board member for Aurora. Uh, first, I want to welcome you all to our presentation tonight, which I'm sure is going to be a fascinating presentation with Anne. Um, I just wanted to say a little bit about Aurora for those who are not familiar. Um, Aurora is the American Rock Art Research Association. We were founded in 1974, and our mission is dedicated to the support of rock art research, conservation, and education. Our members of Aurora come from many backgrounds and professions from all around the globe. We hold annual conferences, and um, our members present research that they're currently working on. We produce an annual volume titled American Indian Rock Art in addition to a quarterly newsletter called La Pintura. For more information, we invite you all to uh, visit our website at www.aurora.org. So without further ado, I'd like you to uh, invite you to grab a glass of wine, sit back, and enjoy Anne's presentation titled A Feast for the Mind's Eyes, the San Rock Paintings of Zimbabwe. Take it away, Anne. Thank you so much. And how do I take it away? Picture the view of Zimbabwe from 20,000 years ago, looking out of this lovely cave called Chikupo, which views onto the great kopis in the distance there, the granite backbone of Zimbabwe. And you might picture big animals wandering around on the flat down there, which would have been dinner. And in that image, I want to give you some context on where Zimbabwe is. We have the little yellow there, south of the Zambezi River, and we're south of the equator because now we're going into spring in Zimbabwe and the rainy season. And also I wanted to show you uh, a comparison of Zimbabwe by size with Montana, because of course we're going to be in Montana next year. Unfortunately, no topography like Montana, no, no Rocky Mountains, but we do have the Kopis, as you see on the left, I hope. And we have the great Zimbabwe Plateau, which is the brown, the dark brown on Zimbabwe there on the left. So almost the same size as Montana, a little bigger. This is a, a, a chance to just recap quickly the colonial history of the country. Zimbabwe used to be known as Rhodesia, named for Cecil John Rhodes, the guy on the left, who received a special exclusive charter from Queen Victoria and founded a colony there about 1893. And the colonial period then ends with the rise of Robert Mugabe, the guy on the right, who overthrew the white supremacist government of Ian Smith in 1980 and established the country of Zimbabwe, which he ruled with an iron fist until he was himself deposed in 2018 by his right-hand man, the crocodile, Emerson Menengagwa. When George and I first started going to Zimbabwe, uh, Mugabe was still very much in the lead in control, but we never saw him. In fact, no one ever saw him because he spent a great deal of time in Singapore, and which is where he died in 2019. Okay, so uh, I want to give you an idea about the rock art areas of Zimbabwe. We have the big circle, which I will talk about, and the medium-sized one, which I will also talk about, and a little one that's new to us that we'll have to save for next time. The people of Zimbabwe are descended for the most part from Bantu speaking people who emerged down into the country about 2000 years ago. Shona is the primary language and yet there are about 18 different Bantu languages in the country. And our guide, Willard Nyambia, is a gentleman in the bright orange shirt. He is Shona, and he's been teaching us quite a good deal about Shona life ways. The Shona and other Bantu-speaking people who arrived are agro-pastoralists. They brought their, their wonderful animals, their, 
cattle that they count as their wealth and their ability to grow crops. And they entirely displaced the people that were there before. Now, one thing to know is Shona themselves have no tradition whatsoever of painting and never did. They never painted anything. Uh, the people who painted were the ancestors of this gentleman, a modern San Bushman person who lives with his family, grouping, not a whole lot of them, on the edge of the Kalahari in Botswana. A few of them also live in Namibia. And this slide on the left shows you some of the things they used to make the art, his ancestors. Uh, you should know that there are no apparently no visible San people living in Zimbabwe anymore. And the people who do live, uh, the San, on the edge of the desert do themselves also not have a painting tradition. So although the people are not extinct, the life ways that included painting the rock art, that is now gone. We are fortunate to know something about San rock art and what it was intended to mean because of the work of the two people on the upper left here, Willem Bleek and Lucy Lloyd, who's his sister-in-law. They did the only ethnography on living San people around the Cape Town area. And they recorded thousands of pages of ethnography, which languished a little bit until revived by the efforts of David Lewis Williams, who is now retired and I understand doing fine and still writing. He's an amazing copious writer. And he is the one who brought forward the idea of the trance dance and the interpretations that we're so fond of about rock art. Now, I should say also though, that Peter Garlake, the gentleman on the right, is the primary archeologist and writer for the rock art of Zimbabwe. And we would agree with Peter that not everything fits neatly into the trance dance explanation. And he's added quite a bit in his book, The Hunter's Vision. And I also want to mention this exciting news from the folks at Bitsauders Rand, David Pierce et al, or Bono is the primary author, about the oldest AMS radiocarbon date that they've found so far on carbon black, which is uh, the black that was used for pigment that's partially burned plant material. Now, I've just heard yesterday from a friend that there's a new article coming out that discusses this result, which is amazing and wonderful, and uh, that there's a new, they're looking at the recipe for the pigment, and they've been able to figure out that it was the same carbon black recipe for almost a thousand years, which to me is extraordinary. Don't have a whole lot of black paint in Zimbabwe, but some. So that's wonderful progress. Now I'm going to take you to the Matobo Hills World Heritage Site, the medium sized circle I showed you before. And this park was established as a heritage site in 2003, at which time they discussed that this is the most dense concentration of painted art anywhere in the world, meaning that it's a small area. And there are thousands of caves packed into a fairly small area. I would love to challenge that. I would love to go find out if that's true. But I can say only that we've only seen about 17 sites in the Matopos. But the big one, the first one we saw was Nanki Cave with Paul Hubbard, who is the park archeologist. It's a bit of a hike, a good hike. Um, and you enter a huge room that is painted from one end to the other. It's just astounding. And you walk along it for hours. Um, Paul took a nap in the corner because we took so long. We were stunned. And the picture on the left shows you some part of the main panel and one thing I would point out are the number of giraffes that are depicted in this. There are about six, if you can see them. And giraffes are extremely common in the rock art of the Metopos. This is my favorite panel from Nanki. I call him, or it, a tree god. 
but of course, I have no idea what it really is. It's anthropomorphic figure without hands or feet, uh, but with something sprouting out of its shoulders. And I show you this in part also to be sure you understand that we are using de-stretch on, on these images for the most part. Uh, I will try to always give you the out of camera color, such as the one on the right, and then on the left, the de-stretch, because it's such detailed rock art and there's some kind of enhancement you need to really see all the details. Also, this two-lobed thing that the tree god is standing in is the way that water is depicted in San rock art. And I'm going to show you some other examples of that. And you see also lines of people in the back. There always seem to be lines of people. And you have a kudu cow on the left, a kudu bull on the right, up by the shoulders, and an ostrich at the top. A great favorite of mine. Also feel that you should know a little about formlings, because formlings are one of the truly distinctive features of Zimbabwe rock art. There may be a few outside the country, but not very many. The vast majority are in Zimbabwe, and they consist of white caps. You can see the white caps on the top and the bottom, and then cores, usually red cores. In this case, uh, there's some yellow cores as well. And you can see some of these wonderful giraffes. There's no question it's a giraffe. It's not that tricky to identify. And I also want to show this formling thing on the left, which seems to be added. Some people have suggested this was added on. And I discovered when we first de-stretched it that there are these little tiny flying things coming out of this formling. Uh, I think they're bees. They seem to have paired wings. When Cranmer Cook painted this, and his painting is on display in Bulawayo, he did not, never saw any of these bees, I don't think, or maybe just a few of them. So there's an association then between insects and people and formlings in the Matopos. And there are lots of insects depicted. Here you see little paired wing creatures that I'm convinced are termites. Now there's some literature that comes when you visit the park that says they're flying ants, but I think you can see from this illustration from the internet that the wings don't match flying ants, they match termites. And termites are wonderful things in that they're, um, when they show up, it means there's rain, it indicates a change of season, and also they were tasty delights for people to eat. So termites are, are popular. Uh, we have a number of other formlings from the Matopos. Here you can see this de-stretched one here. And uh, that are associated with insects. Now, Siaka Maguni, who wrote the book Termites of the Gods, felt that these were termites that were escaping or something, and that the individual was attempting to plug the hole. But I think I favor Harold Pogger's theory that this is an individual with a burning brand that is approaching the formling in order to subdue bees, and that the bees are in there and he's trying to get the honey. And we have another image of that from another cave in the Matopos called Matolawazi. It's a funny little cave. There's a picture of it down there on the bottom, fairly shallow. But it has this same image, uh, only you've got a partners there, the, the male above with a brand that seems to have smoke, uh, curls of smoke that are calming the, the, the bees. And then you have the other guy lying on his side that's poking into the formling or, and or the creature in front of the formling to get the honey. So the association in the Matopos of formlings and insects is pretty clear. We also went to this lovely big cave, which is a habitation area, has lots of rock art on the ceiling, and it held uh, many people over thousands of years, including uh, Iron Age people who arrived later. You can see in the upper right a picture of the Iron Age structure. This is a nice polychrome pair of ostriches with pink legs. 
Uh, the site was excavated in 1950. They found vast quantities of bone tools in Ahmad Zinda. And also there's rock art on the, on the ceiling, the walls. And this is an image that's, again, depicting water. It's that same idea of water being shown as little flecks of paint. And uh, it, it's called a basket shape, thanks to David Colson, and it has fish in it. Uh, which you can probably see in the little yellow circle I just brought up. There's actually someone swimming in there with a the fish, maybe even hunting the fish. But this is also typical of San rock art. You have a lot of going on, a lot of running and animals and a lot of activity. Next to this image, uh, nearby it anyway, is another form link. I think maybe this formling is in a structure of some kind, but I'm not sure. But you have uh, kind of odd-shaped white caps, red cores, and human beings in the lower left, in this case on their, sitting on their heels, that are interacting with clouds of insects. Um, I think this, the people in this are important, and I'm uh, still unclear to me why when Cranmer Cook painted this scene, he left the people out. I think that the association of the people and the insects and the formlings all contribute. The last side I really want to take you to at this point in the Matopos is Bambata Cave. It's um, apparently inaccessible at the moment. I think the thing is the, that the road has washed out, and so you can't get in there. But you can see that there's a depression in the kopi there. And plant and animals, whatever, plant dust has blown in and created like a little, a little garden. And the cave itself is back here behind this tree. Uh, and there is a formling there. Um, painted on the wall. Again, um, people, insects, and a formling all interacting there. But also very important about Bambeta Cave is that uh, when it was excavated, and that was published in 1983, excavated by Nicholas Walker, he found a layer that contained pottery and caprine bone. And the pottery is a very plain kind of pot that they now call bombata ware, and the caprine bone meaning either sheep or goat, you can't tell. The finding of this marks a very important transition layer and the arrival of either people or life ways that involve pottery and domestic animals. So we know that the hunter forager life way ended around this time by 200 BC. So, I'm going to move now to the Harari area, where we have 27 some odd sites that we've seen, the little yellow pegs. Oops, sorry. In this area, I, we've been looking at lots of animal representations. And I made a chart to sort of entertain myself about frequencies. And you can see here that kudu is the most frequent, particularly kudu cow. Uh, there's an uh, unidentified antelope and then lots of elephants. Elephants are the big animal in the area, along with the kudu. Um, and if you follow this chart down and up and down, you'll see where giraffe ends up underneath monkey and baboon. So compared to the Matopos, the, the uh, Harari area has many more kudu. We also have hunters, always lots and lots of hunters, but 98 formlings in the Harari area, at least. And that's unusual. They're not with the kind of insect uh, association that you have in the Matopos, but they're quite numerous. And in case some of you are not 100% sure what some of these animals look like, here's a kudu cow, and she's quite distinctive with her big ears and her alert face and a hump. She has a distinct hump on the back. She also has stripes, but those stripes are not usually seen in the rock art for some reason. Her mate on the left, the kudu bull, also has very distinctive horns. 
And across the bottom too, you can see other antelope where the males and females have horns. Uh, Elin, Sesebe, and Sable, all male and female both have horns. In the case of the kudu, it's only the male. And of course, we have the ant bear, which we might otherwise call an aardvark. Haven't ever seen one of those, would love to. Uh, so 2019, July, which now feels like a long time ago, we went back to Harare and uh, to Zimbabwe generally. We saw other rock art sites, but particularly wanted to stop at the museum because we remembered that there were some very interesting original paintings of rock art on the bottom floor, and we were a little worried about their condition. You can see them there in the upper left. And we uh, had made a connection at the Getty conservation event with Dr. Kuba, Dr. Richard Kuba at the Frobenius Institute, who was very interested in what we had to say. And when we went back to Harare, we also connected with Dr. Mahachi. And we were, one of our goals was to com connect these two gentlemen, because um, Dr. Kuba has a clear connection to the work in that we found in the museum because it's by Elizabeth Goodall, who was one of Frobenius's four original artists who arrived in 1928 to record rock art. And she was trained as an illustrator and she painted as all that all of them did for over a year at rock art sites in Zimbabwe. They called it Rhodesia. And uh, in 1959, she published this book along with others on the right that contained 94 of her original paintings. When we got to the museum, we could only find 29 of these. So 65 have disappeared somehow, but uh, there are 49 other originals there and all of them in urgent need of care. And we're hoping that although the, the um, COVID has kind of slowed things down, we're, we're optimistic about trying to get some help. And we thought one of the first things we would do is to compare Elizabeth's art with some sites that we had been to. So we went to uh, Epworth Mission. It used, the town used to be called Salisbury, it's Harare now. And we went down here to, Glen Nora, so two different sites at which Elizabeth Goodall had painted, which we visited. And the first one then is from the Glen Nora site at which she created the idea of the crocodile men. This is an interesting little site that is also now an open air apostolic worship site. The apostolic folk uh, don't necessarily worship on Sundays. They have several days a week and they uh, like to use rock art sites for their worship. And we saw this site, which is uh, two different panels on the one boulder. Here's Willard holding it up for us to shade it so we could see it well. <clears throat> and this is the panel. Uh, Elizabeth Goodall felt that these were reptilian creatures that were wearing masks. Now, masks are very rare. I, I can, honestly cannot think of any example of a masked figure from Zimbabwe rock art. I think probably we would call these therianthropes. And I would call your attention also to the figure on the far right, uh, because when Elizabeth painted this panel, she chose to omit that figure. She saw these as um, deities of some sort, and she felt that the figures that were bending at the waist in front of them were worshiping them. I think we now see these more likely as figures in trance. So the one thing about this uh, figure is that they're very rare. They're concentrated right around the Harare area. This is the other side of that boulder. And I like this because it shows her painting on the left and our enhanced version on the right and how good she was. I mean, it's amazing. Her, her extraordinary accuracy in the, the colors and the scale and the position of the figures, she really got it right. 
The only problem really with that is that she couldn't see it all. And since we now have D-stretch, we can see things that no one saw before. The yellow circle shows the part below where she painted. And it contains these figures, interesting little guys with antelope heads that are holding on a flask that are probably involved in some kind of a healing ceremony. And I like to compare that to this figure, which it, the bulk of it is out of camera. It shows another healing ceremony. Um, strange figures with terribly skinny legs and little antelope heads. I think in front of the seated figures, there was or is a faint figure that you can barely see. Uh, and of course we have this figure with that's shielding its eyes from something that's coming into the heavens like I don't, maybe a meteor. And you see uh, her version on the left and how badly it needs to be helped. So I'm going to uh, take you now to the rest of Chikupo as our final visit. Chikupo is a big site, a little hard to get into. It's actually a complex of four different caves. Uh, we visited two of them. The back of the walls of this cave are just coated with paint. Here you can see the, uh, some of the elephants walking across the top. Um, the yellow elephant is walking through a row of handprints. Handprints are very rare, but they do exist. And you have some late white which is uh, figures that are usually found on top and maybe of a different style. And you also have here some of the pecking and spalling that are attacking some of this art, uh, natural and otherwise. Apparently people feel that if they flake off little pieces of the pigment and mix it with something, it makes a curing uh, potion. So the sites are, are being badly pecked in some cases, which is tragic, of course. The elephants in Chikupo are special. They, they seem to be touching, as elephants often do in the Harari area. The touch of the trunk is very important. And it's touching what seems to be a dead uh, buffalo here on the right. Um, it has the strange Harari elephant ears that I've talked to you about before. And another part of the same cave that has more elephants. And what I find to be extremely uh, interesting about this one is that this elephant is sticking its head through a formling. Here's the border of the formling. And you can see that the head of the elephant goes through because here's the eye and the trunk. The, the elephant has, has pierced through the formling, which certainly indicates the power and importance of elephants in their rituals there. Also very important in Chikupo is a panel or two of dancing people. Um, that's the interpretation we, we favor. Here it is out of camera and it shows one of the dancers is shown on the right getting ready with its round paraphernalia there. Now, Elizabeth, when she painted this, thought these were armed warriors that were carrying shields, but shields were not used by the sun. I guess she was unaware that this is a sun painting or didn't believe it or something. But anyway, Garlic and we agree that these are dancers with some kind of shape that they dance with. George has worked on this panel with Photoshop. And you can see now it's a procession or a, a gathering of 17 of these dancers that are moving from the right to the left. And they all have these round disc-like things. And uh, each has its own unique emblem that it's holding like this one. And also there's an area here where perhaps they're just they're just getting started. They're just getting ready. This figure seems to be perhaps helping this figure get all of its dance accoutrements ready to go. And when they work their way down, they end up at this elephant, 
which is a half an elephant. And there is no pigment over here. So it's definitely been cut, uh, a half an elephant, which is uh, just an extraordinary uh, scene of dancing. We have other figures in Chikupo that seem to be parading or dancing. And you can see on the right figure that the red dancers are women. These are women because, I say that, because they have breasts, they have bellies, and they're carrying staffs or sticks, which is traditional for women. The men are the larger figures above them that have the bows and arrows. People have told me they've seen women with bows and arrows in the art, but I have never seen this. Always, it's the men who carry bows and arrows, and the women have staffs. And this is my last, but uh, for you artists out there, this, I think, is one of the most extraordinary images we saw. It's from Lower Chikupo, and you know how if you want to give the impression that something is closer, you make it bigger. So in this case, it's a procession of figures that starts on the left and becomes increasingly larger as it becomes close to you. And then they turn and they go away from you. And this is, um, I think, shows the extraordinary artistic ability and sensitivity of San artists. And that's it. Hello. Thank you, Anne. We have uh, we have some time for uh, questions at this point or comments. Probably people are still digesting all of the images that they saw. There was a lot to uh, feast our eyes on, as you promised. Um, so let's see what we've got in the way of um, some questions. I know a couple of them came in. If I can get to my chat screen. You wouldn't believe how I had to cut that. Uh, and what, what was the age of those, of the, what you were showing us basically? What was the age? Of oh, gee, wouldn't I love to know the answer to that question? Um, we, we know that they quit painting for sure by about uh, 500 AD in, in uh, Eastern Zimbabwe. And let's see, when might they have started? Thousands of years before that? I wish I knew, I really do. Do they expect that some of the art may be actually older than the, the earliest date they've gotten so far? Oh, I'm sure of it. I'm sure of it. <clears throat> and what, what would, in terms of style, is there some chronology that people have advanced in terms of, uh, you know, what kinds of styles are the earliest and how it progressed? A little bit of that, yes. Um, there used to be a whole lot of stylistic uh, and uh, color suggestions, and almost all of that has been thrown out. I think the late whites are considered to be more recent. Um, but the rest of it, it's, it's amazingly conservative, amazingly the same for thousands of years. I, I, I find it that way. I, I would say the art has to be at least 5,000 years old and, and consistent in style. Style, yeah, that way. Yes, I remember David Lewis Williams um, said that a lot of this stuff was symbolic. It wasn't necessarily just representing, um, you know, the animals that that we're seeing, but each animal represented something else. Did, do you have any comments on those kinds of interpretations from from your guides or people mm -hmm. that you've spoken to? Well, our guides don't know anything about it and tell you that straight out that they don't. Um, this wasn't made by anybody they knew or had any connection with, so they don't know. They don't even, our guy didn't even know for sure if he had any San Bushman blood in him. I'm not even sure that that happened. Hmm. Of course, um, David Lewis Williams has tremendous interpretive 
structure based on modern San uh, tales and stories. And I, you know, we can get into that, but how much of that actually applies to the San who lived in Zimbabwe has always been a question, an open question. Um, I, I suggest to you about the bees, I can suggest to you about elephants that are a certain kind of meat, but um, I, I personally uh, shy away from too much of that. Yes, of course, the, all the art is symbolic and, 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 and therefore significant in that way. Yeah, I mean, certainly some of it looked like it was depicting everyday life, like, you know, hunting for bees or termites and such, whereas other stuff, you know, obviously looked very uh, ritual or, you know, in, in terms of the way the elephants were, were presented or the, the formlings. Any, any thoughts about what the formlings were? Someone in the chat suggested, could they be related to termite mounds? Well, that's, and that is, of course, what Siaka Maguni has, which is that they are termi termitaria. And he has an interesting connection between termites being messengers between the gods and earth. Um, and Peter Garlick had an idea that when ordinary scenes, quote unquote, like a camp scene was depicted, it was actually representing archetypes. In other words, they're never um, elderly people or sick people or injured people or it's they're always the epitome and so if it if it's showing a, a camp scene it's the best camp scene it's the the perfect camp scene well I'll buy that um, someone asked whether uh, what they used for pigment do we know um, well it's the hematite yeah, um, the black, the idea that it's this carbon black is very intriguing because I, I think we always thought it was charcoal or manganese or something like that. But now it, it seems to be partially carbonized vegetable and, and, and hematite, hematite nodules, of course. It's the usual. The binder is the question. And to my knowledge, no one knows anything about that in Zimbabwe. Hmm. Are there any uh, related uh, peoples that are still doing rock art in Africa that might have uh, some some relationship with this? There are people still doing rock art to some extent in Africa, but none that I believe are related to this. Okay, we had a question. Is there a, is there a place responsible for archiving copies of the imagery that you showed today? responsible for it uh, if you mean is the um is the zimbabwe government attempting to do anything like that not to my knowledge we did have to uh, obtain a, a legal permit in order to take pictures there but um i think probably the british museum or the Frobenius institute would be the best two places at this point uh the, okay. We talked a little bit about uh, some of the potential interpretations and somebody was asking um, whether there was anything noticed about cracks being entries into the sacred world, um, just like we kind of hear about sometimes in the Southwest. My impression is that David Lewis Williams develops that idea um, at length with the Drakensberg. Uh, that there there is a passage between the the um, other world and the present world through cracks. Uh, to my knowledge, there's nobody that talks about that for Zimbabwe. I never you, saw anything like that. You didn't see anything like that. What was with the ele the elephant and the formling? Any thoughts on that? I'm assuming the elephant is asserting power over the formling. Why it would want to do that or need to do that, I don't know. I don't, I don't think anyone really knows what it is with formlings. They're, they're incredibly curious. Um, they're a funny shape. Sorry, I, you're not going to get me to go too far with this because I, I don't, I don't, I'm not a speculator really. Yeah. And, and do they show up pretty widespread or are they, they tend to be very localized in the art? They're specifically in in Harare and Matopos only, 
Like we didn't see any in they're, they're supposed they're supposed to be, yeah, we didn't see any in the Masvingo area. There's supposed to be a couple on the other side of the Limpopo that would be in South Africa. Uh, they're kind of funny looking. Yeah. Like, they don't look like them to me. Yeah, you wonder if they actually corresponded to something man-made, you know, ceremonial accouchements or something. Frobenius thought they were rocks. Hmm. They look like rock, rock piles to him. Huh. Um, how about how, how about how tall were the anthropomorphs that you were showing? They're about four inches, maybe three or four inches yeah, for the small. Three or four inches, the little ones, and the tree god is. There, yeah, the tree god is maybe three feet. I, oh wow! I, they're not very big, really. All things considered. They're, they're ten, there are some really tiny ones too. They tend to, they're, they're tend on the small side. Hmm. Did they know what they used for uh, a, a painting? Did they have some kind of a brush? Yes, there, there, there seem to be, I think they've found some kind of materials that would be, I've never seen that. I've seen the pigment, I've seen the, the dish that they mixed it in, uh, they, yeah. I, I've not seen one, but I'm presuming it's some kind of vegetable thing. Yeah. I have a question about the disc panel. Is it all right to ask out loud? Yeah, go uh, ahead. <laughs> thank you. Uh, when we were in Tanzania, uh, the women wore these big discs around their necks when they danced. And so many of the figures in that panel seem to have uh, the disc right around the neck or right by the head. I wondered if it might be depicting some sort of dance ceremony. Yeah, I I, th I do think it's a dance ceremony. I think you're talking about the Maasai, right? Yes. Yeah, and um, of course, this post the arrival of the Maasai wildly post dates the um, San Bush people. But why not? Of course, it's I, it's clearly some kind of, of dance paraphernalia. Definitely. Great. Uh, any other questions? Um, I think we've, uh, if you have anything else, you can put it into the chat. Uh, uh, did they ever do any chemical study for the uh, pigments for aging? Sorry, I didn't get that. I'm um, talking to my phone fast. Did they, did they ever do an, an, a pigment analysis by chemical uh, study? She's asking whether there was any chemical analysis of the pigment. Oh, gee, guys. I, these people are um, struggling to get fresh water and electricity. And I don't think that anybody is thinking along those lines. No, to my knowledge, it's never been done in Zimbabwe. And I don't believe anybody's thinking about along those lines. I, I was thinking in terms of aging. Yeah, sure. Wouldn't and we'd all love to see somebody working on this? My understanding: the work is being done in South Africa. Uh, whether they've uh, done anything with the with the with the binder of the pigment, I don't know. Well, beyond the carbon black, which is obviously the basics of the black pigment, yeah. they're, try they're trying. You did mention that there was some archaeology done at one of the sites uh, where the ceramics and all were found. Was there archaeology done in any of the other sites? There has been archaeology done by, um, well, Nick, Nick Walker did some things and um, Cranmer Cook did a bunch of things. Cook's radiocarbon dates are not well thought of for some reason, although he used a Pretoria lab to get the dates. But um, all of this really screeched to a halt about uh, 1988 or 1985 to 1988. Most of these folks left the country mm. and um, um, there hasn't, there is, there is, the university has an archeology span department and they have done some surveys uh, with limited publication. They're a little hard to come by, but I have seen a few but they're basically just survey reports before some mining operation or something. They're not, there's nobody really 
pulling it all together the way they did in South Africa. Are there any other questions? Okay, well, I'm, I, I, oh, I, yes. I just wanted to uh, compliment you on the your use of D stretch and how nicely it was done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah, well, you promised us a feast and you uh, delivered. So thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I would like to uh, thank everybody uh, who attended for your interest. Again, if you would like to learn more about what Aurora does, please check out our website. We also have a Facebook page. Our next speaker on November 14th will be Dagmara Zawatska on the Algonquian rock art of the Canadian Shield. And in December, we will travel to Missouri with uh, Carol Diaz Granados for a deep dive into Mississippian iconography. So until then, good evening and stay safe. <laughs>